Example 8 is very much like example 7, where you're matching the slope field with the actual differential equation that created it. Um, let's do part A, starting with the graph and going to the equation, because it could be asked either way. If you see a graph like this, uh, might be a multiple choice question with five equations as answer choices. What you want to look for first is maybe where there's zero slopes. And if you notice there's zero slopes, all the way what appear to be down the line y equals negative x, something like that. So when x and y are what signs, would you possibly get a zero? Opposite, right? A negative x, like in quadrant two, a negative x and a positive y, or in quadrant four, a positive x and a negative y. So when x and y are opposite signs, um, possibly you're going to get negative slopes. If you want to think about it this way, when y equals negative x, you're going to have zero slopes. And if you solve that, you get y plus x or x plus y equals zero. So it should be something to that effect where you're adding x and y. Hey, there it is. All right. Now you can also look at it this way. If there's another one that kind of follows that same trend, look for positive and negative slopes. When x and y are both positive in quadrant one, what types of slopes do you have? Positive, right? And that's the same with, with x plus y. It would preserve that. When x and y are both negative, you have what type of slopes? Negative. So you can then look for trends, where is it positive, where it's negative, and kind of zero in on one of them. So we got A matching up with 4, and 4 matching up with A, however you want to do it. All right, let's do the next one by equation. Let's look at this one here. You might have an equation and then five different graphs that you have to match it up to. If you start with the equation, again, think about where you're going to have zero slopes. You're going to have zero slopes when the numerator is zero. So x equals zero is the y-axis. So look for one that up and down the y-axis has horizontal tangent lines. You also notice that when y is 0, you're going to have vertical tangent lines because you're going to have non-zero over 0. And vertical tangent lines don't show up that often, but when they do, they're pretty easy to spot. So that's when y equals 0. That's on the x-axis. So look for one that has vertical tangents on the x-axis, horizontal tangents on the y-axis. Which one might that be? Well, C is looking like a good candidate. There's horizontal tangents. And notice it looks like a bunch of concentric circles. So as they round down here, you're going to have vertical tangents on the y-axis, even though they're not shown. So that's the answer. Now, it is interesting to note that even, uh, well, the, the plus C, when we solve a differential equation, this one is separable. The plus C is not always responsible for a vertical shift. In this case, once we solve and kind of move C around, it becomes responsible for affecting the radius of these concentric circles. Awesome. Okay. Um, and so that just leaves two more. This one here is pretty easy to spot. If you notice, we have along rows what appear to be parallel slopes. And so this means that it doesn't matter what the x value is. The slopes only depend on what the y value is. So the differential equation would only have a y value in it. And if you notice, it looks like there might be zero slopes right here, even though they're not shown. So look for an equation that just has a y in it. When y is positive, you're going to have positive slopes. And when y is negative, you're going to have negative slopes. So it should be some positive number times y. Hey, there it is. 2 matches up with d, or d matches up with 2. And, of course, that leaves this one here. This one looks like it has zero slopes. For a particular x value, like at x equals 1 or x equals 2 or x equals 3, uh, it ends up being at x equals 2. If you spot something like this and you can identify possibly that the general solution is a family of parabolas, possibly, like x squared, then the derivative would be some linear function. And so you can narrow it down that way. Okay, um, let's look at example 9. The slope field for a differential equation is shown over here at the right. There it is. Which statement is true for all solutions to the differential equation? All right, so it's one of those multiple, multiple choice questions. When x is less than 0, that means to the left of the y-axis, all of the solutions are decreasing. Let's see if that's true. To the left of the y-axis, all the solutions are decreasing. Is that true? Nope, because over here in quadrant 2, it looks like we have what type of slopes? Positive, and so that's not true. So 1 is out. So hopefully for test-taking strategy for a problem like this, you know if one is out, you go through 
and you get rid of any answer choices that have one in it. So now we're down to a one and three shot if we guessed. All solutions level off near the x-axis. That would kind of imply like a, some type of horizontal tangent. Does that, does that appear to be true? All solutions level off? If you dropped in there anywhere and followed the trend, does it look like you're heading towards the x-axis? Yeah, that one appears to be true. Um, and of course, if the solution is the x-axis, of course, you're level off on the x-axis. So two appears to be good. So it has to have, it has to have two in it. So it does come down to all three. For positive y values, the solutions are increasing. Well, positive y values are above the x-axis. Do we have positive slopes everywhere above y equals zero? Yeah. So it's going to be two and three, which means the answer is D. That makes a nice question. Not that difficult if you know what you're looking for. All right, example 10, another multiple choice question. The slope field for the differential equation, this one, oh my gosh, that one has a lot of X's and Y's. They don't give us the graph. It's going to have vertical segments when what? Okay, vertical segments means vertical tangent lines. What do we know causes a vertical tangent line? Zero in the denominator and a what in the numerator? A non-zero, right. Zero over zero, you throw those out. But non-zero over zero is a vertical tangent line. That's some type of infinity. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative infinity. So what we want to do then is, like when we did implicit differentiation, remember, and we were asked to find where we have horizontal and vertical tangents? In this case, we want to know where there's vertical tangents. We take the denominator, we set it equal to zero. Now, because it has two unknowns, remember, we can't solve like x equals a number or y equals a number, so we solve for either x or y. And it doesn't matter, but on a multiple choice question, previewing your answers kind of helps you decide what to solve for, right? All the answer choices are solved for y, so that's what we'll do. So we get 2y equals negative 4x, and if we divide through by 2, we get negative 2x. So all along the line, y equals negative 2x, we're going to have vertical tangent lines. So the graph might look something like this, long negative 2x, something like that. That's what the graph might look like. And that's answer choice B. Now, here's one thing that we would maybe want to consider. If this negative 2x caused a zero in the, in the numerator, then it would cause a zero in the top and bottom when we would throw it out. Do you even need to check that based upon your answer choices? No, because none of them say none of these. Um, so negative 2x is it. All right, actual multiple choice question. Not that bad. Example 11, another multiple choice question, but a multiple multiple choice question. Which statement is true about the solutions, y of x, of a differential equation whose slope field is shown to the right? All right, so we've got to interpret it again, and we'll just take these one at a time. If y of 0 is greater than 0, that's giving us kind of a range of a particular solution. That basically says when x is 0 and the y values are positive. When x is 0 and the y values are positive, that is going to be along that line, would you agree? When x is zero, but y is some positive number, the limit as x goes to infinity is zero. If y, oh, so if y of zero, so what does that mean? Sorry, if, if y of zero is a point and it's a positive y value, so if I drop in here or here or here or here, if I drop in at any particular solution along that line, and I head out to the right, are my y values getting closer to zero? No. If you drop in and, and go out to the right, they all appear to be going where? They all appear to be going to infinity. Yeah, they're going up. The 1 is not in there, so it can't be A and it can't be E. If y of 0 is between negative 2 and 0, so if you drop in at x equals 0, somewhere between y equals negative 2 and 0, which means you're going to drop in somewhere now. Let's use a different color. You're going to drop in somewhere in this purple region. Is it true then that as you go out to the right, you're getting closer to negative 2? Well, let's see. Let's just drop in somewhere. Drop in here. If you follow, it looks like you're getting closer to negative 2 there. 
drop in a little higher, and it looks like you're getting closer. Drop in in the middle. Yeah, it appears that anywhere you drop in along the y-axis in that little y interval, you're going to be approaching negative 2. So that one appears to be true. So it's got to have 2 in it. So it's B possibly or D possibly but not C. And, you know, sometimes maybe you don't have to consider the last one, but the answer choices are usually set up so that you do have to consider all three. This one's saying if you drop in on the y-axis below y equals negative 2 and you head out to the right, are you approaching 0? Well, let's use brown for that. So drop in somewhere there. If you drop in anywhere along that line, are you approaching 0? No. And what they're doing here is for the person who's not looking carefully, it does look like they're leveling off towards some horizontal line, right? But there's so much clutter on there, you kind of forget maybe where the x-axis is. The x-axis is up here. So as they go out to the right, they're approaching negative 2 as well, not the, not the x-axis. So that one's false. And the answer then is just B. Yeah. The answer is B. So whether you're analyzing an equation or you're analyzing a graph, you know what you're looking for. Okay. The next set of uh, problems are just sample free response questions. They do make nice free response questions for a total of nine points. I think we're just going to work on these until the end of class, and then we'll, we'll be done with slope fields. So whether we finish all of them or not, I think you'll have enough to kind of keep going. So the worksheet will be due tomorrow, and I'll make a folder. I'll try to make a folder today so that it's not just there like in the morning. All right, so this one was from the 2007 Aloha exam. They make a different exam for the Pacific Islanders because of the time zones. And they used to release them, but now they don't. This was question five on the Pacific Islander exam, form B. Um, consider the differential equation dy dx equals one-half x plus y minus one. Just looking at it from your brief experience with differential equations, do you think this one is going to be separable and therefore solvable at this level? No, Brandon, why not? Because it's not separable. Yeah, right? It's not separable because it's not separable. It's because the X and Y here are being what added, added and, or subtracted and could possibly be, but not multiplied. So, yeah, so they're not going to ask you to solve this differential equation, so don't try. On the axes provided, sketch the slope field for the given differential equation at the nine points indicated. Okay, spot the nine points. Uh, don't, don't draw it anywhere else but the nine points. Now, on this one, again, you might want to try and think of where x, where the, where the slopes are zero, but it might not be the most obvious thing unless you want to solve it for y. If you solve it for y, you get y equals negative one-half x plus one, right? So all along that line, negative one-half x plus one, you're going to have zero slopes. That's another way to do it. Okay, well, where would that line exist? Plus one would be right here. And then the slope would go down one, right two, or up one and left two. So the only place where I could maybe do a zero slope would be right here at zero one. So whether you do it that way or not, it's up to you. The other option is just to kind of pick random points and plug them in. So let's do that. Let's just plug in the origin. What do you get when you plug in the zero, zero? Negative one. All right, negative one is one of your big time ones. Make sure you draw that as close to 45 as possible. Long enough to see, but not, not long enough to interfere with the others. How about the point 1, 0? When x is 1 and y is 0, we get 1 half minus 1, which is negative 1 half. Okay, so negative 1 half is going to be less steep than 1. How about a negative 1, 0? Negative 1 for x gives you negative 1 half minus 1, which is negative three halves, so now it's a little bit steeper than one. It would also be nice if they were the same length. So notice what my, my slopes are doing as I go from left to right. They're, they're getting less steep, okay? So I'm kind of like pulling them like that. All right, zero, one, if you hadn't figured it out, plug in a zero for x and a one for y, and you do get zero. We kind of knew that one already. So that's another important slope that is horizontal as you can make it. If it's not horizontal, erase it and try it again. Negative 1, 1. Negative 1, 1 is going to give us negative 1 half. Do we already have a negative 1 half drawn? 
Yes, it's that one there. So on paper, you're just going to try and draw it as close to that slope as possible. On notability, you can copy and paste it. Kind of a nice little treat. Plug in a 1-1. One, one. Plug in a 1-1, one, one, and you get positive 1 half. Have we drawn positive 1 half yet? No, but we're going to try to draw it now the same steepness as the negative one half just in the positive direction. Something like that. All right, moving up the ladder now. How about zero comma two? Zero for x, two for y, we get a positive one. We haven't drawn that yet, but it's another important one. That's your positive 45 degree. Very important for reference purposes. And then one comma two gives us a three halves, which is a little bit steeper. And a negative one comma two gives us a positive one half. So it's doing the same thing up there at y equals two as it was doing on the x-axis, but in the reverse direction. They're getting slightly steeper. All right, and there it is. So basically, that's kind of what you're expected to do. You've got some ones and zeros, and then you had, you know, one that was a little bit steeper than one and one that was a little bit less steep than one. That's, that's enough for comparison purposes. Okay, that would probably earn two checks, I'm guessing. Part B, find the second derivative in terms of x and y. That's something you don't want to take lightly, in terms of x and y. That means there can't be any dy dx's in there. There could be numbers, symbols, and x's and y's. And then describe the region in the xy plane for where all the solutions are concave up. Okay, I see where they're going with that. I'm going to use the second derivative to answer a question. I can hardly wait. I need the second derivative first. So I'm going to take the derivative of the first derivative. So what I'm going to do is write the first derivative down here. dy dx equals 1 half x plus y minus 1. And to show that I'm taking the derivative, labeling my intentions, I'm going to say the derivative with respect to x colon. And the left side becomes d squared y over dx squared. It was already explicitly solved for that. And remember, since we're taking it implicitly, everything that's not an x, an independent variable, gets a d variable dx. So the derivative of 1 half x is 1 half times dx dx, which we don't need, plus the derivative of y is dy dx, which we do need, minus the derivative of 1 is 0. Is that answering the question? Is that in terms of x and y? No. So that will equal 1 half plus, and now you just substitute dy dx from the line above, 1 half x plus y minus 1. Could you stop there? Yes, you could. I just substituted that in right there. Now, you might want to keep going on the next line because you're going to answer a question with it. So 1 half x plus y, and then 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. So you can combine those two constants. You don't get bonus points for that, though. All right, now it says to describe the region in the xy plane where the solution curves are concave up. Any solution is going to be concave up when its second derivative is what? Positive. So to communicate that, we're going to just say greater than zero. And if I need to describe the region, we're, we're used to, when we have x's and y's, solving for what variable? Y. If we solve for Y, we can interpret Y equals something as a graph, and then we can use the inequality to say it's above the graph or below the graph, right? Whether it's the graph of a line, a quadratic, that's what we did in Algebra 1 and 2. So let's solve this for Y. And uh, the Y is on the left, so we bring the negative 1 half X across and becomes a positive 1 half. And there you go. So Y has to be greater than that. Now we have to interpret it. This is the graph of a what? A line, right? And greater than the line means where in relation to the line, above or below? Above. So let's go ahead and write the sentence. The solutions are concave up um, for all, what do they say? I'll use the word. Um, how about just um, above, the solution curves are concave up above the line 
y equals negative one half x plus one half. That's interpreting it above the line y equals negative one half x plus one half. That's good. And that's it. You can uh, maybe even draw that on there. I don't think you would want to draw that, but you can kind of see where it would be, right? The, the slope would be negative one half. The y intercept would be one half. The slope there would also be negative one half. You can almost see, and I'm going to erase this, but you could see, you could see that line coming in right through there, right? These slopes were negative one half, negative one half, uh, and you can just kind of visually see above there. If you were to drop in anywhere, you could kind of see them as part of a smile. So yeah, and then below there, it looks like they're concave down. So it looks like we did it right, but don't don't draw that line. Don't volunteer that. Because uh, you've probably already earned points up above, and you can only lose points if you go back and they don't ask you to. All right, part C, let y equals f of x be a particular solution to the differential equation uh, that passes to the point 0, 1. Now, again, they didn't ask you to draw the solution passing through 0, 1, but if they did, it would look something like this. It might be something like that. So don't volunteer it if they don't ask you to do it. We just need to find the equation of it. And then it says, does that function that we find have a local max min or neither at zero? Justify our answer. Okay, this is going to be fun. Let y equals f of x be a particular solution. Here's where some students get frustrated. <clears throat> They're going to take the differential equation from right here. Oops, wrong thing. And because it says to find the particular solution, they're going to do what? They're going to attempt to separate the variables, get y equals, and then find the value of c using the initial condition. But, unfortunately, we can't do that. That's non-separable. So how can we do that? Passing through the point zero one. What's that? Well, we can find the equation of the tangent line there, right? We need a point. We have the point. We could find the slope there. We can write the equation of the tangent line. This little tangent line right here. But I think I know what it's going to be. The tangent line itself is horizontal, right? So it'd be y equals one. But we're trying to find the equation of the um, of the line itself, or the equation itself. How can we do that? If we can't separate the variables, what do we know? Let's see what we know. We know that there's a point. Uh, 0, comma 1, right? So that satisfies the function. And at 0, 1, here's what else we know. We know dy dx at the point 0, 1. We could find that. Let's plug that in. If I plug it in, I get 1 half plus 1 minus 1, which equals what? Yeah, maybe I'm on the wrong It equals one half. And the slope equals one half at zero one. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not plugging it in right. I'm plugging it should be zero. There you go. I was gonna say that's not right. So that equals zero. So that's what we that's what we knew. It equals zero. What else do we know about that? Yeah, we know the conc it's concave up, so is this going to help us? Did it ask us to find the equation? Maybe I'm reading wrong. Do we need the equation? Let y equals f of x be a particular solution to the differential equation passing through 0, 1. Okay, I'll let that happen. 
Does F have a relative minimum or maximum at zero? Justify your answer. Do we need the equation of F of X there to answer that? No. You're not going to be able to find that equation. There's no way to do it. You can't separate the variables, and there's no other trick to do it. That's why they don't actually ask you to do it. But we can still answer the question that they gave us. So in order to justify a local max or min, we need two things to happen. First of all, we need the derivative at that point to equal zero. Did we already verify that? Yes. So we know that x equals zero, or we could just say so zero comma one is a critical point. You can use the whole thing, a critical point of f of x. So it's a potential local max or min. Now there's two ways to justify the local max. We can either choose a value of x to the left and to the right on the derivative equation and see what the sign change in f prime is. But do we know how to do that? Do we know what the derivative equation is for our function? Well, we know what the derivative equation is but I have to plug in a point X and Y to determine that. And that's going to mean I need to know a point X and Y that are actually on my solution curve to the left and right. That's going to require knowing the solution curve, right, which we already saw we cannot find. So is there another way to determine local extrema without having to look left and right using the first derivative test? Is there a second option? Yeah, the second derivative test. And here's the benefit of the second derivative test. You don't have to know any information left or right. It only requires information at that point, namely the concavity. What did we just find up here in part B? That the solution curves are what? Concave up above the line negative one-half x plus one-half. Is our point above that line? Yes. So here's all you'd have to show then. The second derivative of y with respect to x at the point zero, one. Let's go ahead and plug it in up above. We have the second derivative all simplified right up here. So if I plug in a 0 for x and a 1 for y, I get 1 minus 1 half, which is equal to 1 half, which is greater than 0. So what I did is I plugged my critical value again, remember, into the second derivative, and I got a positive number. And that means that the function is concave up, and the critical value, if you button this lip, is a local min. So this is the math work that shows what you're doing. So now you just have to say, so uh, f of x has a local min at 0, 1. If you want to add by the second derivative test, you can. You don't have to because you're actually doing the second derivative test. There you go. So you don't need another solution curve. There was a similar question one year where, um, if I can find his name up there, Zach. Zach, no, not Paris, another Zach. He, he, he squandered most of his time, Zach Klossner, Guy Klossner, class of 2006. He squandered a lot of his time on one problem trying to solve a non-separable differential equation to answer a question like that when he didn't need to and it didn't ask him to do it. Um, he still made a five, notice, but... Uh, he could have maybe made a six huh? if he wouldn't have squandered his time. So anyway, he was upset at me for not showing him how to solve those. And I was like, you're not expected to solve those at this level. You would need to have like Cal 4. Cal, our, our TA, Mr. Cook, is in differential equations right now. And it's usually like a Cal 3 or a Cal 4. And then you learn to solve more things like that. So uh, keep that in mind. And we just, we, I just demonstrated here that it's, it's not real possible. We haven't tried to manipulate the variables yet, but I think we've done that. You're not going to be able to get your X's and DX's and Y's and DY's separated. All right, so here's the, the follow-up question, part D. The question that always makes you go, hmm, at the end of a free response. The one you kind of look forward to, right, because it makes you think. It's kind of novel information. Find the values of the constants M and B for which Y equals MX plus B is a solution to the differential equation. Now, there are several ways to approach this problem. The first way would be to recognize that, hey, that's Algebra 1. That's Algebra 1. That's the equation of a what? A line. So I want to know the slope and the y-intercept of a linear solution. So you can just kind of mosey up here to your graph and be like, I kind of recall something about a linear solution. 
They look like they're curved up above a certain line and curved down below a certain line, but there's a place where there is actually a line as a solution, right? And it would be what? That one there. What's the equation of that line? I think we found it over here, right? Negative one-half x plus one-half. So you could say uh, from part B, it's always good to say where you're getting stuff, from France, whatever, from part B, uh, the linear solution is y equals negative one-half x plus one-half. So m equals negative one-half and b equals one-half. Done. Piece of cake. What that requires of you, though, is to recognize that. You have to be very perceptive to do that. And that was a legal way to answer that question. Kudos, good for you. You're paying attention as you go through the problem. How else would you do it? Mm. Well, if y equals mx is going to be a solution, here's another thing, another way you can do it. What do we know about the curvature of a line? Bless you. There's no curvature. So if you know there's no curvature, what should the second derivative value be of that solution? No curvature. Curvy. Curve eh. Curvature. There you go. Then the second derivative of y with respect to x should be what? Zero. Do we have the second derivative? We do somewhere. Here it is all cleaned up. So if you take the second derivative and you set it equal to what? Zero, and you solve for y, what do you get? You get the equation. And then you say, so, you do want to go ahead and answer the question specifically. That is stating your M and B. That's another way to do it. Can anyone think of yet another way to do it? Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's try another way. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. To be a solution to an equation, let's let's get our dy dx again over here. Those are all great methods, but uh, let's explore maybe yet another one. Just kind of playing around. If I want to know where y equal if y equals mx plus plus b is a solution, here's what I here's what I know. It means that I should be able to plug that in to that equation and get a true statement, right? So let's let's try that. Let's replace y in this equation with mx plus b. I'm going to get a one half x plus y, which is mx plus b, and then minus one, right? And that should equal dy dx at that point, which is the slope of the solution at that point. What's the slope of that graph the whole time? It should be m. So you can actually set it equal to m. Now, how does that help? Well, good question. Um, m minus mx. Let's get those together on one side. Or maybe we should keep the x's together. How could that, would that, should that help us? Seniors, if you have already started your scholarship application, please stop by the Career Center for some information before you continue on with your process. Also, track students, the cookie dough will be delivered today. Cookie dough. Uh, it will be in the film room. Oh, uh, man. The field house, uh, ready for pickup right after school. So please make sure you stop by after school to pick up your cookie dough. Also, teachers, please remember to return your signed report card rostered and unsigned report cards to Mrs. Norris by the end of this period. Thank you. Oh.
I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, get this in the form MX plus B. Um, so I collected everything on one side. I factored out the coefficients of my X, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if this will work. If this then is the coefficient of X, then one half plus M has to equal M. Nah, that doesn't like that. That doesn't work. And then this would have to equal B. No, that doesn't quite work. Hmm. There should be a way to extract them from here, plugging in and getting a true statement. You're trying to find the values of M and B that make it a true statement. What if I factored out an M and I got 1 minus X equals, I don't want to do that. Hmm. Not my favorite way to do this problem. M M M Y equals huh. what if I left that as Y? No, no, no I don't. Anyone have an insight onto that one? How to how to treat that mess to extract M and B from there? the slope to be M, it has to be a true statement, what values of M work? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's uh, two other ways to do it. Okay. Um, we have ten minutes, right? Or, or so? Eight? Let's let's jump to um, let's jump to I think we've done one like that. Let's jump to two thousand eight number seven uh, example seventeen two thousand eight number five. Consider this differential equation where x can't be zero. We've done this one. Oh yeah, x can't be zero. You do draw a vertical, uh huh, uh huh. But notice in this case, the only value that that happens at is when x is zero, um, and it says x can't be zero. And that's not just in the differential equation; that's in the solution. So um, notice that when the numerator is zero, that's when y is one. So you can draw a little horizontal tangents all the way across there. Um, don't draw it on the y-axis. Uh, so negative one zero. If you plug it in, you're going to get negative one over one, which is negative one. So there's the slope of negative one. Plugging in a 1, 0, uh, you get a negative 1 over 1 again, which is also negative 1. Plugging in a 2, 0, you get a negative 1 fourth, which is going to be pretty darn flat. Okay. Um, plugging in a negative 1, comma 2 gives you a 1 positive 1 fourth which is positive pretty flat. And then 1, comma 2 gives you the same thing, positive 1 fourth. And then a 2, 2 gives you a one fourth. Wait, yeah, those are wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going in a hurry here. When x is 1 and y is 2, 2 minus 1. It should just be 1. Thank you. So that would be positive 1 and then positive 1 over there as well because of the x squared. And then I plug in a 2, 2, and I get 1 fourth. That's the flat one. Okay, so that looks better to me. That has like symmetry across this uh, line y equals 1 if you reflected them. 
So there's there's the graph. So these two here should be the same steepness in opposite direction, and these two should be the same steepness as those in the opposite direction. So this is going to probably be worth two checks, one for the zeros and one for all the others. Find a particular solution. The particular solution means separate the variables, f of 2 equals 0. So step 1, separate the variables. If you multiply both sides by dx, you're going to get 1 over x squared dx. And then if you divide both sides by y minus 1, you get 1 over y minus 1 dy. So that right there would get the check for the separation. Now, if you want, you could call 1 over x squared x to the negative second. Same thing, but a little bit easier to integrate it on the right side. Once you separate the variables, you integrate. Put it in the front. And then the antiderivative on the left is what? Your inside function is y minus 1. Its derivative is 1. Sometimes those are flipped, as we saw in the notes. It could be 1 minus y, and you'd have a correction. But in this case, there's no correction. It's just the natural log of the absolute value. You don't need a plus c over there. That would probably earn a check. x to the negative second by the power rule becomes negative 1 x to the negative first. That would probably be a check. And then plus c would probably be another check. All right, now we're going to work at solving for c, or I'm sorry, for y first. So we E both sides, and you don't have to show that on the left. And you're going to get E to the negative 1 over X, if you want to put it back in that format, plus C. Keeping the absolute values there, we do our little trick now, right? And you don't have to show that intermediate step of times E to the C, but that's essentially what we're doing. E to the negative 1 over X times E to the C, and that becomes new and improved C in the front. And then you can drop the absolute values once the C's in front without putting a plus or minus because it absorbs it, and you get your general solution when you add 1. And that makes sense. It looks like an exponential function that's shifted up one unit. That looks like there would be a horizontal tangent at y equals 1. Now for the uh, initial condition. You could say at the point 2, 0, or when f of 2 equals 0, you get 0 equals c e to the negative 1 half plus 1. And now you start peeling back the layers. You subtract 1, and you divide through by e to the negative 1 half, and that equals c. So you're going to get a check right there for plugging in and using it. Now, if you want to clean that up, that's equal to c equals the e to the negative 1 half comes to the top, and the 1 half puts it back under the radical. So negative square root of e or negative e to the 1 half, positive 1 half, however you want to write it. And then the final equation is so y equals e, which is negative e to the 1 half, e to the negative 1 over x, and then plus 1. So you can leave it like that. Now, because the base is e and your c value also has a base e, you could combine the exponents and call it negative e to the power of 1 half minus 1 over x. I wouldn't do that necessarily, but you have that option. Um, and that makes sense because notice there's a negative in front, which would reflect it down. And the point is 2, 0, so it would pass through this point here, which is below that horizontal asymptote. So we're basically reflecting it across the x-axis and then shifting it up. And that's going to put us in the right spot. The last question, what's the limit as x goes to infinity? This is that question that makes you go, hmm. But this one is not that bad. The limit as x goes to infinity. Remember, we can kind of plug in, per se, to x. What's happening to 1 over x as x goes to infinity? Make sure you put y or y of x there or write the whole thing there. It's approaching 0. So what's e to the negative 0 approaching? 1. And what's 1 times negative e to the 1 half? Negative e to the 1 half and then plus the 1 that's outside there. There's your answer. How hard was that? Not hard at all. That's your answer. You could spice it up a little bit by saying 1 minus the square root of e, and the AP graders will give you bonus points, right? Nope. No, they won't. <clears throat> so there. That, there you go. That's like a, you would get like six points for part B, and then uh, two points for part A and one for part C. That's a nine-pointer right there. Free money in my book. All right. Uh, there's other ones on here. If you want to look at the old videos or try them on your own, 
you can look up the scoring guidelines for something like this. Uh, but I think you have slope fields down. It's not that difficult. Uh, we'll jump into Euler's method tomorrow, the first BC only topic. Yeah, go get it. All right, any questions? You can speak into the microphone. Any questions? Hi. Uh, Lauren is really close to meeting her first goal on fundraising, so if you'd like to donate to the cause, she's really close. Um, there was a great article in the paper last Saturday, so if you haven't read it, Pick it up. I'll put it on my wall.